little small pamphlet that Swamiji wrote back in 1982. It was called uh, A New Dispensation, and I put it somewhere. You can find it if it's not yet available. He talked about the real nature of creation and the world. And he talked about these great, as he called them, cosmic rivers of consciousness that sweep through the universe and sweep across planets and um, draw all the forces of creation into a particular focus at a particular time. In Autobiography of the Yogi, Master talks about Babaji. And he talks about how most avatars come at a particular time for a particular mission and they are visible, they are born and then they die and during the course of their life, you know, magnificent things happen that then go on for generations. Babaji, by contrast, they describe as one who is concerned with the, the long, slow rhythms of the development of consciousness in Shin on Earth doesn't really give you a boundary of, of where that responsibility lies. And he's mostly not world known until Master published what about the Yogi in 1946. He was practically unknown. He would be discovered just by the metrics of what people search on Google. That uh, more people search Bhagavad I believe even the name. They go read all the Bible the Yogi and they'll remember about it. I'll talk a little bit more about it and then we'll go over there. But the point is this that there is there are these powers which are the real powers of this planet. And Autobiography the Bible Yogi also says Jesus and Babaji are the constant union and together have the salvation of this age. And in the Arthur of Fee, not in the Arthur of Fee, in the Festival of Light every Sunday, we have that phrase, Jesus appeared to the great master Babaji, that my people, people I came to serve, are serving selflessly, but they're not communing with God. And that's really what I came to teach, and we have to do something with God. So, together, fully conscious of the nature of this world, they've been working for that salvation. Now, all of us who simply find ourselves here on this planet, you know, we, we come out of a womb, a little baby somewhere, and few of us are like Master who can actually remember being baby and remembering prayerful surges in many languages. Prayerful surges in many languages as a child and crying in frustration because he couldn't express the devotion he felt in his heart. I mean, very few of us were conscious enough to know those things. So we just find ourselves here, and very gradually, and all of us have young memories of when we begin, we began, one way or another, to try to sort out what we were doing here. And sometimes it was very alarming to realize where we were. Um, one of my friends tells me he was the firstborn in his family, and he remembers. He remembers the first days of his life just as a random memory. And he remembers his father holding them, him and then not knowing what to do with him, handing him to his mother. And then his mother holding him for a little bit and she didn't know what to do with him and she handed him back. <laughs> he remembers being passed back and forth and having the conscious thought, these people don't know what they're doing. <laughs> and one way or another, you know, we gradually try to figure out what's really going on here. And it's either because our lives are miserable or it's because our lives have already assumed what Yogananda called the anguishing monotony. And that is the real drama. There's all this other stuff going on. Nations are having wars with each other. You know, uh, demagogues are arousing the worst qualities in the masses. 
economies are rising and falling, you know, the ocean levels are rising, the icebergs are melting, the whales are dying from plastic, whatever good or bad things are happening on the planet, and at the same time people are doing fabulous things to expand consciousness and technological capability in all directions. And it's very easy to mistake that for what's actually going on here. And it's not that we're not here, that we have no role to play in serving those outward realities. But Swamiji made a very interesting statement. Um, I'm not even exactly sure where it was, but this is what he said. He said, the purpose of life is not achievement. You know, it's not to be excellent and perfect in the things that we do. Although, he said, if we try to achieve perfection in the things that we do, we may also act over that if we are more attuned to a higher reality, we will become more excellent at what we try to do. But he said, if we make our objective first to be in tune, he said, then outward achievement, if it's meant to be, which it often is, Swamiji said, will also come. But if we're only focusing on outward achievement, we are also in danger of falling into selfishness, unkindness, hard-heartedness, lack of sensitivity to others, where if we first seek attunement, we are less likely to fall into those mistakes of limited consciousness. So attunement is what we're really here to achieve, but it's a very subtle, something that cannot really be easily quantified. And the way we begin to find it, often, is by really tuning in to the instruments through which divine attunement is expressed to us. Swamiji says, you know, everything in this universe works through instruments. He talked about electricity. He said, electricity exists, but if I just tried to plug this battery pack, you know, into the air, nothing would work. But if the system is set up, then this power can be drawn in, it can be harnessed, it can be directed, and everything in the material world is a symbol of a higher reality. <clears throat> and everything that we see, the way the universe is organized, the way power is accessed and directed for good, is a symbol of what's really going on here, which is that we are the wire, we are the channel, we have that potential to attach ourselves to these great rivers of consciousness and actually begin to flow in those rivers. And in that way, the, 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 the great longing of our hearts will be fulfilled. Swamiji says, free will exists, but not in the way people imagine it. He said, free will does not exist in egoic isolation. He says, free will is the freedom to choose what river of consciousness we're going to become an instrument for. And then, he said, just like, uh, he said, it would be foolish for the leaf riding on the river to claim that the leaf is responsible for the power. But when the leaf surrenders to the river and then it can flow with the river, then the entire power of the river is what carries it. And so in spiritual life, it's been organized, and the masters declare, as Swami said, God could liberate us directly, but divine law says it has to be done through the intercession of a guru. Just as we can't pull the power right out of the air, even though it's there, it has to be done through the intercession of the guru. And these gurus, because God is a loving God, and because there is this great divine power of love determined to lift us back into itself, there's this constant, constant emanation and this constant return and this constant personification of the power of grace available to us. You know, and we're standing now, we're standing in front of the shrine of Jesus and we've been promised 
in, by Yogananda that Jesus is living with us now and is committed with Babaji to our salvation. You know, many of you know I spent two months in the last 10 months or so. Uh, I, was, I, was, I spent a month over the last 10 months in Israel and went from where Jesus lived. And I've always had a, a, a connection to his continuing reality, but it was activated on a level that I could not have anticipated when I went there. Master says, wherever a, an avatar, wherever a man of realization has lived, his vibrations remain in the atmosphere forever. I mean, that's, a, that's just a, you don't even know where to put that, you know? I've always had, I'm not, a, I'm not interested in politics, I don't pay attention to politics. I've always kind of assumed that the, whatever conflagrations are going to come over our planet will come out of the Mideast because that seems like a place where they would come. I've just, in, in a random, unthought out way, just sort of thought that what's there now eventually won't be. But after I went to those shrines, those places where Jesus walked, I thought to myself, God will not let that be destroyed. You know, Jesus' incarnation and being there, because now it's a Jewish country, and there is such a confusion of dogmas. You know, dogmas have nothing to do with religion, but people get really confused. There's such a confusion of dogmas that you have this very orthodox Judaism sort of living in parallel with this sometimes very fundamentalist Christian and and then you have the Christians all divided up into all these other things and really none of it has anything to do with Jesus. It's, it was catalyzed by his presence and for some people those avenues can be an avenue back and Judaism can be an avenue back to God. It's a true religion. True religion is just true religion. It doesn't matter what you call it. But what one experiences goes, actually I want to put it like this. There was a satsang that Swami gave in India once when I just happened to be there. He was, when he was first living there around 2003, I came in from America and that evening he had all the ashramites at his house and he was just talking. And in the course of things, he made a very interesting statement. He said, because this world is so complex, and you know, it's getting more and more complex, Sometimes just the little business of taking care of my own life, there's so many dimensions to it and it just never seems to stop. Just one thing after another and my life is relatively simple. It's just so complicated living in this world and now they're discovering all these things and today is the anniversary of landing on the moon and it just, you know, it all just gets bigger and bigger. So we think of God being so huge, we think he must be bigger than all of that and also more complicated than all of that. But Swamiji said it's so exactly the opposite because everything in creation emanates from silence and stillness. And the closer you get to that silence and stillness, you're getting closer to a singularity, not to a complexity. And that, that's the essence of the childlike devotion of it. It just becomes so simple. And so very often in our spiritual life, we miss the simplicity of it. And we work so hard to make it complicated when in fact it's so simple. So there was Jesus. And he was called by the sincere desire of his own people, which were the, was the Essenes, were the Essene sect of Judaism at that time. There were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes, and they were very different from the other. And the Essenes was considered to be the, the what you would call true remnant from a higher age. So I would call it. This is not how our Orthodox Jewish guide would have called it, but this is what I called it. And I'm a little concerned when we go back and I say this in front of him, but this is what I would call it. All right. That they were Sanat and Dharma, they had preserved it. And it was very simple. Attunement with God, be ye therefore perfect, even as our Father is perfect. To all who received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. 
And Jesus walked through, you know, a very low age, a very Kali Yuga age, when the priesthood, forget religious titles, it doesn't matter, when the priesthood had become corrupted by power and money. I mean, is that a new story? It's like, this is the story. Th because these are, this is what happens. We get confused. And we use our free will to tune into the wrong river. So there's all these powerful rivers of power and money. It's all documented historically. And Jesus just walks in the middle of it and calls people to him on an entirely different basis. And that basis is joy, love, and true freedom. And he never had a chance against the power structure. The first time I went there, they, the, the, the big temple that... that was considered to be the apex of Judaism by the Orthodox Jews is mostly gone, but there's this big wall. It's a retaining wall for the temple. It's not a wall of the temple. I stood against this monstrous stone thing, you know, which is just this a piece of this edifice. It completely represented exactly the opposite of who we're trying to be. It was fixed, it was rigid, it was power-oriented, it took a lot of money to do it, it took commitment from a lot of people saying this is the truth. And Jesus would only go to Jerusalem to hurl himself against those rocks, knowing that eventually they would crush his body. And then he would take his disciples out to the Sea of Galilee, which even to this day is still quite open and quite free. And it was there that they went to the hills, and that they sang, and that they danced, and then that they loved. But he had a destiny, Jesus did, and eventually he went back and confronted that power and showed, even though it wasn't obvious at first, that there is no greater power than the power of God. And that there is nothing that this world can do to us, that the power of God is not greater still. However, Jesus was arrested, he was crucified, he did die. So it appears as though the power of the world is greater. But three days later, he walked out of that tomb. And you know, if you go to Jerusalem, you can get into this, it's a little church inside a bigger church, and it's a little room inside the little church. And you go into a place that's about as big as this actually a little smaller. And there's, you know, the classic picture, there it is. This is where Jesus was lying. And when I actually went in there, it, well, you can't describe it. But it really happened. And that's the simple truth. It's not that I want, you, I want to make you all that kind of believing Christian like that, but there is no power on earth more powerful. There is no power anywhere on any planet, in any civilization at any time that is more powerful than the power of God. It will not necessarily spare you the necessity to rise to meet it. But whatever God asks of you, he will also give you the grace to be able to do. That's what Jesus' life was about. Lord, let this cup pass from me, he said, which is my favorite prayer. <laughs> because Jesus had an opinion, and he didn't hesitate to tell God, I think this is a really bad idea, what you've set up for me. <laughs> he wasn't afraid for himself, but he'd brought this message of hope and love, and he could see it was going to be rejected. He wept for Jerusalem because he saw it was going to be rejected and that suffering would ensue. He came to liberate them from suffering and they didn't want to be liberated. Some, let this cup pass from me, he said. Because how could the tender heart not want it to? How, could we, how can we stand in the world we're living in right now and see so much callous disregard for, well, so many things? So much strange capacity to do evil to one another. How could the tender heart be indifferent to it? We have to say, Lord, do you, are you sure you know what you're doing? You know, do you want me? I'll chime in. You know, do you want to hear my opinion? 
I remember on different occasions with Swamiji when something or another would happen, and I would suddenly say, do you want to hear what I think? You know, because sometimes he did, sometimes he didn't, you know. If you want to hear what I think, I have an opinion here. And so I would express it, or can express it. So you can tell God, this is really terrible. But then it has to be followed by, but thy will not mine be done. That's the combination that brings the resurrection. It may also bring the crucifixion, but the crucifixion is a moment, and the resurrection is for eternity. And that's our free will. Which reality will we live in? And Jesus exemplified it, is still working to help us, is eternally present to help us when that vibration (coughs) is what our heart calls for. And so this is the power that Jesus brings us today. Let's now chant, meditate, make our offering, and each one of us bring, however we understand the presence of Jesus, as powerfully as we can, as a living reality within us, and then in the pure privacy of our own consciousness, offer the little light that is in us into that greater light of bliss. (laughs) 